Hello, uh, my name is Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm the head of Bluestack Productions, Inc., publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And we're here today uh, for another in our series of conversations on environmental matters. I'm very pleased today to be here with Lorcan O'Toole. Lorcan, you're very welcome. Good morning, Bob. And we're very lucky we're in the middle of uh, the Glenvay National Park. Um, and it's actually sunny, which is not always the case in Glenvay these days. But it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful place. If you've not been to Glenvay, please come. Uh, Lurkin, you're the project manager at the Golden Eagle Trust. I'm working with the Golden Eagle Trust, it's a small charity dedicated to the restoration of Irish, lost Irish birds and um, threatened habitats. Um, we've got three primary projects ongoing at the moment. Um, the Golden Eagle Restoration and Reintroduction Program in Donegal, the White Tail Reintroduction Program in Kerry, and the Red Kite uh, Reintroduction Program in both County Wicklow and County Dublin. So we've got a kind of a, a geographical spread across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus to date has been on restoring birds of prey. We're trying to draw public attention to the great wealth of birds that are missing from mm -hmm. our native uh, flora and fauna. Yeah, it's interesting too. I think it's important to, to focus on the fact that it's a reintroduction of these species. It's not an introduction of an alien species. And, and so the reintroduction suggests they were here one time before. And, and where, where were the golden eagles and, and, and when were they first in Ireland? Well, the Golden Eagles probably came here after the last Ice Age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's various archaeological evidence to show how widespread they were. They were found in Woodkey, for example, in Dublin, plenty of bones from Golden oh. Eagles alone. Um, there's plenty of old artwork and historical literature making reference to Golden Eagles. Mm -hmm. In particular reference to Golden Eagles, the, the Irish or Gaelic name Ullar Fearain actually means the, the Joe, the Noble are just eagle uh -huh. in comparison to the white tailed eagle, which is Ullar Wara, which would be basically a sea eagle, uh -huh. and even the Irish word for red kite, which is a core, or another phrase they have is prechon kirchach, which would basically trans translate as the, the, uh, the cloth kite. Uh -huh. So clearly, people long ago had a close affinity with all our large predators. From the 1850s onwards, uh, there was a more serious decline in the eagles, a quicker decline. I'm sure part of that was due to change in, in habitat, you know, the explosion of the Irish population from the 1760s onwards up through to the famine. Mm -hmm. and most of that population was a, a rural population, maybe in comparison to other European countries. Uh -huh. So, you know, there would have been more grazing pressure, a lot of the habitats would have been interfered with, there was human pressure competing maybe for game animals. Uh -huh. um, but mm -hmm. it was really persecution, it was human attitude that drove the eagles over the edge in Ireland. Uh -huh. And that again is uh, reflected in the contemporary literature and correspondence that has been studied by various people. The white-tailed eagles maybe last bred in 1916, okay. and the red kites probably bred or last bred much earlier. Okay. Uh, and that could be due to a large amount of deforestation. So a lot of the tree nesting birds, such as maybe osprey, goshawk, and red kite, became extinct with the almost complete deforestation of Ireland. Mm -hmm. We can read that only maybe 1% of the country was uh, forested in the 1800s, which is an incredible statistic. Mm -hmm. So there's always this tension between uh, the persecution of, of the eagles from farmers, mostly small farmers, and the kind of conservationist movements at the other end of the I think it's, the it's, it's a real difficulty that at times yeah. people don't uh, think enough about it's very clear to say poisoning of eagles is bad. Right. We, I think most people in the conservation movement would accept that. Right. I would suspect that most people, general public uh, accept that. Mm -hmm. But it's how you phrase the language, because a lot of this persecution is a result of people who have traditionally killed foxes and crows. Right. And again, you, know, you also need to explain to people who are killing foxes and crows that the reason they're killing foxes and crows is possibly because those populations then are slightly higher than would be the norm in a true wilderness. Mm -hmm. Because in a true wilderness you'd have a wolf to control okay. the foxes, or you'd have more eagles to control the crows. I suppose what we're trying to do uh, in particular, because if you look across to Britain, yeah. there is a recognised serious conflict between the shooting community right. and bird of prey conservationists. It's well established, mm -hmm. it's soaking up a lot of energy and funding, trying to counterbalance the political lobbying of each side. Mm -hmm. We're trying our best here to build a stronger relationship with the farming community and also the hunting community. Because if you go to parts of Northern Europe, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a, ho a, a large overlap between the hunting community and the uh, bird of prey movement or mm -hmm. charities. Um, so it's, it, it's trying to do things maybe in a slightly new fashion mm -hmm. and build bridges because we're of the view 
despite all the legislation and policies, that actually human attitudes right. are the key driver are, are, are of the population levels of birds of prey. Right. Now, now the the uh, you've reintroduced the the golden eagles, and and what's the when did that start? We started. We, we set up the Golden Eagle Trust in 1999. Uh -huh. uh, initially, we had hoped that Dukas at the time, now called National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh -huh. or Irish Wild Bird Conservancy, now called Birdwatch Ireland, would actually take the lead on this project. Uh -huh. um, the Golden Eagle Trust <coughs> is a partnership between the Curlew Trust, <coughs> sorry, the Curlew Trust and the Irish Raptor Study Group. Uh -huh. And we set up in 1999. Uh, we basically had a shelf company. We're still hoping that. Uh, statutory authority or the largest conservation group in Ireland would lead on the project mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and then we got funding in the year 2000 we applied for a Scottish license in the year 2000 we were actually too late in applying mm -hmm. so we first brought Golden Eagles back to Ireland in 2001 from Scotland from Scotland and, and explain why Scotland was mm -hmm. why it was important that they come from Scotland as opposed to other places well, all reintroduction programs um, are governed by international criteria set mm -hmm. up under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The IUCN guidelines are a regular term you'll hear in reintroduction projects. Mm -hmm. And under those best practice guidelines, you're, you're advised to bring back populations that are as close as possible genetically to mm -hmm. the former population. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the, the new founder population and the former population. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are no eagles in Ireland so we can't get that genetic stock. Right. And the view would be that in the past that the Irish golden eagle population, the Scottish population, would have been linked to some degree through the north east of the island of Ireland and the southwest of Scotland. In Scotland, <coughs> did they ever, was there ever a disappearance entirely of the golden eagles or they always had maintained some population of that? The Scottish population decreased quite remarkably also in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh -huh. But the remoteness of some of the areas in the Western Isles and the Northern Highlands where the human population was so low, uh -huh. uh, the population stayed uh, okay. at low numbers. The white-tailed eagle population in Scotland was driven to extinction uh -huh. and they reintroduced the white-tailed eagles and they also reintroduced the red kites. The golden eagle uh, reintroduction was in Donegal only and why did you choose Donegal for that? Well, we looked at the various potential counties, and primarily we looked at Kerry, Galway, Mayo, and Donegal as the counties with the largest amount of suitable upland habitats. Uh -huh. um, and we scored them on a, a variety of criteria, probably eight or nine criteria, the primary points being uh, food availability, uh, persecution levels, mm -hmm. potential human attitudes, and also the kind of lo logistical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So we looked at live prey availability and also carrion and where whilst there could be a lot of dead deer in Kerry, Galway and Mayo mm -hmm. or dead sheep rather and um, we felt that there, the hare numbers and the rabbit numbers and the prey numbers in Donegal were as high as other counties. Mm -hmm. Maybe the primary driving point was the fact that there was a, a large number of buzzards and other bird of prey mm -hmm. in Donegal at the time mm -hmm. and they are an indicator species that if they're living there's no poison where they are living because they would eat uh, meat bait, say a dead rabbit or a dead lamb uh -huh. that was uh, dosed or baited with poison. Uh -huh. So the presence of buzzards were an indicator of the, the okay. comparative lack of poison in Donegal. Uh -huh. There were no buzzards in Mayo, Galway or Kerry uh -huh. at that time. Um, and maybe a, another factor that was crossed our mind was that the fact that the Donegal community and peoples have always had a strong association with Scotland through uh -huh. work primarily uh -huh. uh, and they'd have family connections in Scotland and uh, the sheep farmers in Donegal would have a relationship with the sheep farmers in yeah. Scotland they, mm -hmm. they go to March to get black faced sheep in Perth on occasion and so on and so forth uh -huh. so when we started here and we got in touch with the Irish Farmers Association in Donegal one of the first things we suggested to them was that they should contact the Scottish National Farmers Union uh -huh. and seek their opinions on the attitudes of farmers to golden eagles uh -huh. And that was very useful because the Scottish farmers told the Donegal farmers, yes, a golden eagle can kill a newborn lamb. Uh -huh. And there's no equivocation there. But they said it's such a rare event and there's so many other problems. Uh -huh. I put it in context, it's not a real issue. Uh -huh. I'd have to say from the outset I've found the, the IFA in Donegal exceptionally supportive. Uh -huh. uh, we've built up a very good relationship and I think it largely depends on the individuals. There was individuals there who were under pressure from members of the IFA to, to, right. to knock the project on the head from the outset. Uh -huh. But they gathered their facts and they uh, held their counsel and they sought outside opinion. Uh -huh. 
and I think the Scottish farmers reassured them and I think there was an acceptance particularly maybe amongst the um, the hill sheep farming community where there is alliance on outside work also to bolster their farming income mm -hmm. that they knew that the golden eagles would be beneficial to Donegal tourism uh -huh. so there was a, a kind of um, a, a broader outlook rather than just pure farming they had a, mm -hmm. a, an outlook or a consideration for wider aspects of rural development and so on and so forth and over the last 10 years the Donegal IFA have been um, steadfastly supportive of the project they've condemned poisoning outright mm -hmm. in local media and national media no equivocation mm -hmm. poisoning is wrong but and also uh, Larkin it has to be said that not only were there receptive ears within the Donegal farming community but you also spent a lot of time individually working with people on, on the, from the farming community on that issue we, we did we deliberately yeah. invested a lot of time yeah. in community attitudes um, and ironically, and we look back in hindsight now and say it was a blessing, we were disappointed when we didn't um, bring birds in in the year 2000, because mm -hmm. we were funded by the Millennium Project, but there were kind of blockages as regards attitude in various public uh, bodies mm -hmm. that we overcame in April 2000, and that was simply too late. We should have really been applying for the application in January or February of that year. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, in hindsight, those additional six or eight months were invested primarily without the birds in Donegal, in communication, local schools, local groups, farming mm -hmm. groups, uh, hunting clubs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we look back at it, that was that a really off, solid foundation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now let's, let's talk about the tally of, of, um, of how many birds were reintroduced um, yeah. and what the status is of that population now. Well we've brought over and released 60 birds. We have um, two birds in the cages now at present in the year 2012. Mm -hmm. So that'll be hopefully 62 birds released. Uh -huh. we, our original target and our expectation was to release 75 birds over five years. And the, the Golden Eagle field workers and experts and researchers in Scotland felt that was very feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 420 pairs of Golden Eagles in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Our license from the Scottish government only allows us to take one chick from nest with two chicks. Mm -hmm. And those broods of two are quite rare. At the start, there may have been uh, the Scottish, our Scottish partners were saying, well, we'll be able to get maybe 15 birds a year. As it turns out, the most we've ever got at any one year was 12. Mm -hmm. And to be frank, mostly we've got between kind of two and six birds a year. The subsequent research showed that only maybe three or four or five percent of the entire population would have two chicks uh -huh. of six or seven weeks of age, because a lot of the, the younger siblings die Mm -hmm. within two or three weeks of age. So we've struggled to bring in sufficient donor stock. We have looked at Norway uh -huh. uh, and they've said that it, it's very difficult to get nests uh, with two chicks amongst the golden well. eagles and they suggested if they were to do it they'd need to hire and use a helicopter for access reasons and uh -huh. we simply don't have the funding to do that. Right. Um, with the other projects, uh, 160 red kites have been released uh, primarily in Wicklow, uh, 120 have been released in Wicklow and 40 birds, well 40 were imported into Dublin, one died unfortunately in the cages, so 39 kites were released in Dublin, mm -hmm. and in Kerry 100 white-tailed eagles have been released over a five-year period. Now of the 60 that were released, what's the, the status, are there, there were four or five that have been we've had identified as dead? <coughs> we've had probably more that have been identified as dead, we've had maybe four or I'm five sorry, natural died causes. from natural causes, mm -hmm. and we've had uh, five birds that have been confirmed poisoned, including one in, in found in Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. There's anecdotal information to suggest other birds were poisoned where the corpses weren't recovered. Uh -huh. Anecdotally, there's, uh, there are reports of three birds being, three golden eagles being killed in Northern Ireland illegally. Now, statistically, we can use that. <laughs> right. But we are aware of those comments and they seem to be quite serious and we've passed uh -huh. that information on to the police service of Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. Now these were killed by, by sh shooting or? Poisoning. Poisoning. Two uh -huh. in Antrim and one in Fermanagh. Uh -huh. The confirmed poisoning in Northern Ireland was in County Tyrone. Okay. We've had um, one confirmed poisoning here outside, uh, well just on the edge of Glen Bay National Park near Dunlewy. Uh -huh. We've had a confirmed poisoning in, um, in, on the sligo Leitrim border also. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one in Tyrone. Now, there are other birds that have, have gone missing in areas where we suspect that they, they were setting up territories. And I'm quite surprised because once an eagle sets up a territory, they should really live there for a large number of years. Mm -hmm. um, 
so there's that grey area and, and the issue of poisoning we feel that most of the poisoning in, in Donegal and other counties is the targeting foxes and crows but mm-hmm. it is illegal because the Department of Agriculture banned the use of poison to kill foxes and crows in 2008 mm-hmm. unfortunately there wasn't a huge amount of publicity given to that at the time mm-hmm. and subsequent parallel legislation by um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service in 2010, October 2010 has made it quite clear that poisoning is illegal and there are fines and consequences and so on but mm-hmm. the fact of the matter remains the Department of Agriculture themselves on the common agricultural policy adopted by 27 European countries mm-hmm. have banned the poisoning of foxes and crows. Going back to the 60 that were released here <coughs> and, and the ones you've identified as being poisoned or, or persecuted, how many are, uh, have you identified that you know are alive? Well over the last six months we've probably come in contact with about 23 birds alive in Ireland. This is either through visual sightings or through the satellite tags? Primarily through visual sightings uh-huh. because some of the older birds don't, their Good satellite tags. tags and radio tags are no longer working. Uh-huh. Uh, a number of these birds would be territorial birds. Uh-huh. At the moment we'd have eight territories in Donegal, uh, five territories with pairs of eagles and three territories with single birds. But there are also younger birds wandering about because as I said it can take four or five years for mm-hmm. a young golden eagle to be reach adulthood and set up in a territory. How big is the territory for? It varies in size. It can be anywhere from maybe 12,000 to 16,000 hectares. Okay. Depends on the type of habitat and food availability. Mm-hmm. We've only had two territories that have produced chicks to date. Uh-huh. One here in Glen Bay and one on a coastal site. And the pair in Glen Bay, their primary food source uh, has been hares. Uh-huh. The, believe it or not, the second commonest food item in the nest has been badger cubs and the third commonest item has been fox cubs. Uh-huh. They've also taken crows, ravens, uh, grouse and several other bird species. Uh-huh. Our coastal pair have taken primarily hares, they've taken fulmers, rabbits and a few grouse as well. So mm-hmm. you can see it's a mixed relationship. We have one mm-hmm. pair in this coastal area where the farmers have actually said they've lost less lambs since the eagles moved mm-hmm. in. And how many have uh, uh, bred here? How many eagles are born Le- in Donegal? We've had eight golden eagles that have fledged in the wild uh-huh. and the thinking is that uh, a wild bred golden eagle will be much more productive and uh, yeah. a, a stronger individual than a released bird because uh-huh. obviously they get the, the, the full parental attention mm-hmm. through their chick stage and post fledging stage. Mm-hmm. The birds we take here we do the best we can but we're very aware that we're not going to be as good as rearing a hunting animal or uh-huh. a, a rear eagles that will be as strong as wild fledged chicks. Basically we, we feel that the, the behaviour of the eagles that are in the cages here for a short period of time mm-hmm. does replicate the wild behaviour mm-hmm. but surely they benefit from spending time with the adults mm-hmm. post fledging learning hunting techniques that they may learn over a 12 or 18 month period. Mm-hmm. So the eight wild bred chicks we've lost one definitely to poison mm-hmm. there are two or three in the vicinity and really once that first generation of Irish Golden Eagles begins to breed, we feel uh, things may improve. I've seen some videos of you on the on the, your website too, uh, working with the birds and, and you know, working with them, and, and listening to you today, you have a deep affection for these birds. And where did, where did you first get involved with working with eagles, and, and when was that? Well, I, I, I probably trace it back to, to, to growing up, not in a kind of a professional sense, but just I always had an interest in birds. Um, yeah. I grew up in, in Dunleary in Dublin, I grew up beside a, a mature woodland uh, mm. at the back of Sally Noggin Church and I, I lived in, in just behind the uh, Cliney Shopping Centre uh-huh. and I was the only uh, Dublin born child amongst the eight children, all my brothers and sisters were born in the Iron Islands so they were, uh-huh. had grown up looking for birds nests all the time uh-huh. on the Iron Islands and then when we moved to Dublin I suppose they were doing their thing and I was holding the hand as a young boy <laughs> looking for nests so I always had that interest in, in finding uh-huh. and looking for nests in particular. I was never an egg collector believe it or not but I used to <laughs> like looking for a robin nest or a blackbird nest uh-huh. and then as I grew older maybe in my teenage years I, I did some bird watching but I wasn't particularly interested and then later on I did some voluntary work for the Royal Society of the Protection of Birds in Wales uh-huh. and also in Scotland uh-huh. Uh, my first job was with the Irish Wild Bird Conservancy on Rockabill, which is a Terran colony mm-hmm. on the North Dublin coast. And then from uh, later on, I went over to Scotland to work for the Royal Society of Protection of the Birds. Uh-huh. 
I've I've had a broad interest in birds in general. I suppose through my work in Scotland and Ireland, I've uh, become more um, funneled towards birds of prey. We appreciate you talking with us today. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Rick.